Would members of the executive committee please come to committee room one for quorum? So 11.3, rate supported budget solid waste management, uh, recommended 2020 solid waste rates and fees, and that was held by Councillor Crawford. Uh, so we have no deputations. May I ask uh, first then, are there any questions of staff? <laughs> Councillor Crawford, did you hold it to, for questions or to speak? Okay. Uh, are there questions of staff on the uh, waste uh, management uh, budget? Okay. Uh, if there are none, then we'll move to speakers. Uh, and uh, any speakers from outside of council, outside of the uh, committee? No. All right. Then uh, over to you for uh, comments, uh, Councilor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I just wanted. I felt um, the rate budgets sometimes just whiz through fairly quickly here, and it doesn't give them the due justice of the work that staff do. So I just want to thank the staff at the Solid Waste uh, Division for the work that they've been doing over the last year. Uh, and as we talked about with water, waste, uh, waste removal at the nuts and bolts of the services in the city, um, we need to keep them affordable for the residents of this city. Um, staff have been working incredibly hard uh, over this last year. They'll be bringing or this, what's before us is a, a waste rate, rate increase of a modest 2.5%, which is around the rate of inflation, it's about seven cents a day. Um, that doesn't reflect, I guess, when you're looking at the longer conversation we're going to have to be happening probably next year. And uh, one of the discussions that did come up through the budget process was the long-term capital plan with solid waste. Uh, and that really means the, the question that um, will be coming really next year is what do we do with Green Lane? 
and how do we manage the future of uh, Green Lane in, in coming into the future. Um, there's a number, there's a bit of discussion on that, but of course that is something when we're getting into next year will be much more of a bigger discussion and I think there will have to be some decisions made. Similar to when we had the 9 over 9 for water uh, rate, we may find that we may have to do, I wouldn't say that high at all, but we may look at having to do some sort of uh, long-term um, two or three year rate increase to be able to meet the needs of the, uh, the capital investments that we need to do. Um, now what did come to the committee uh, uh, by a few deputations, and it got a bit of a notice out in the media, uh, was the rebate system, or rebates. Um, that's not part of the, rec the recommendations here. Um, as council or executive will uh, be reminded that we made the decision last year to phase out the rebate program over three years, uh, which is really the true cost of garbage collection. Um, we will be dealing with that in the, um, the operating budget in, in January, so this is not before you, I just want to make sure that we're all aware of that. But other than that, just want to again thank um, the staff and of course the committee uh, for the great work they did on this particular uh, budget and I just want to recommend it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Crawford. Are there others uh, wishing to speak on the uh, waste, solid waste uh, uh, rate supported budget for 2020? Okay, well I'll just echo uh, Councillor Crawford's uh, a vote of thanks, not just for the budget but for a job generally well done. I mean I think people, uh, again, you come to take it for granted, which is in a way as it should be, uh, but it's uh, very well done. It's more complicated than people think and there are some long-term issues that we will address, as well as the rebate issue which we will address uh, as people wish uh, during the time of the uh, operating budget discussion. So uh, if there are no other speakers, uh, I will then uh, call the question on item EX 11.3 the rate supported uh, recommendation. Uh, I assume Councillor Crawford's moved that recommendation. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. Uh, next then that brings us to item EX 11.6 which was being held uh, for uh, deputations and uh, the first uh, deputation was from Michael Rosenberg. Michael still here? I, I didn't see him after lunch. Well we'll stand that down in case he comes in. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next uh, deputant was Carla Villanueva Danan, Parkdale Activity Recreation Centre. Good afternoon. Welcome. You all set up there or do you need a minute? Okay. Okay, you have five minutes and then there may be some questions. Thank you. Wonderful. And you can hear me all right? Loud and clear. Okay, good day. Good afternoon to the members of the Executive Committee. My name is Carla Villanueva Danin and I'm a resident of South Parkdale. I'm a staff member of Parkdale Activity Recreation Centre, working specifically on the Parkdale People's Economy Project, which is a local community economic development project and network of over 30 agencies serving Parkdale residents and community members across employment services, settlement services, and overall well-being. I'm also a volunteer at Kababayan Multicultural Centre, one of the anchor agencies located at the site of the hub that is up for discussion today. My following comments have been informed by feedback collected at various community-led engagement processes conducted over the past two years by Parkdale People's Economy, Parkdale Neighbourhood Land Trust, Parkdale Residents Association. Um, as well as conversations with Flor de Lise Dandal, the Executive Director at Kababayan, and my own experiences as a Parkdale resident and community member. The quick summary of what I'm about to share is yes, please do approve this report as it is today so we can get moving on to phase two of the Parkdale Community Hub. The community is itching and to move into this new phase, to the second phase, so that we can start to have decision-making conversations on how this hub will be community-led, community-designed, and community-governed. To get things started, and perhaps shake up the tone a little bit, I'm gonna tell you how my Saturday morning went. On my way to an appointment, I walked past the Parkdale Library just prior to their doors opening at 9 a.m. and I saw no less than 20 community members standing outside on the icy sidewalk in feels like minus eight weather. A quick scan of the group and I could see shades of brown skin peeking out under the scarves. I saw young fathers holding their toddlers and bundled up community elders leaning against the cold brick walls for support. The group was a mix of ages, races, genders, and more, all bundled up in winter coats on this chilly past Saturday morning, waiting for a place they could just be with one another. 
After my appointment, an hour later, I started to walk west on Queen Street towards Roncesvalles and spotted yet another group of no less than 20 people and families standing outside in line um, to enter park, waiting for their turn to fill their carts with food from the Parkdale Food Bank. I share this anecdote with you to highlight the urgency of moving this work forward. We don't have time to wait. We want phase two now. Parkdale has historically been unique in its cultivation of community spirit. The demographics of, Parkdale, of the Parkdale neighborhood we know today are marked by key shifts in the late 1970s, including mass deinstitutionalization of patients formerly in hospital psychiatric care uh, at former Queen Street institutions, the influx of single Filipina women working as nurses at nearby hospitals, uh, making their homes on, the, on Jameson in the shock of the 70s high rises, and more recently, an influx of stateless refugee Tibetan families, as well as members of various diasporic communities, Roma people, Vietnamese, Tamil, Chinese, black folks, and even more communities who, who I am not um, able to name today. Parkdale has historically been the most welcoming neighborhood for newcomers, immigrants, racialized folks, low-income folks, consumer survivors. The work I support at Parkdale People's Economy emerged as a direct response to the aggressive private development pressures encroaching on the community from those neighboring, neighboring eastern um, communities or neighborhoods of West Queen West and Liberty Village. Parkdale's affordable housing stock is being eroded by wider market financialization and property speculation. I'm going to talk about myself again. This month, I celebrate my three-year anniversary of moving into my current South Parkdale one-bedroom. In June 2019, just six months ago, another apartment of the exact same configuration on my floor was listed for rent at 40% more than what I was paying as an in-place tenant. This pressure is untenable, and I recognize my own positionality as someone with mostly full-time work and generally low, lower barriers uh, to, uh, compared to some of my neighbors, to securing meaningful participation in the workforce. In South Parkdale, 90% of residents are renters, many renters who have already been displaced from their motherlands. I think about the thousands of Tibetan residents concentrated on that Jameson corridor from the waterfront to Queen Street, and how this community has continued to survive and thrive, self-organizing, with limited state and institutional support. In summary, Parkdale is a vibrant neighborhood because of the people who are living there in place today. It's a spirit that has been fostered over several decades by community members who are either no longer with us or have been priced out of their homes. We especially would urge council to move forward in purchasing the adjacent properties to ensure that deeply affordable housing is developed, that this site continues to nurture that spirit that Parkdale is welcoming and that the people who have built that, that spirit continue to enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? Okay, well, I think it was, it, it, the message got across loud and clear, so I think that's it's not a lack of interest, just that you conveyed your message very clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil Anderson. Okay. All right. Uh, next then was uh, Laurie Ann Gervin. Gervin. Thank you. Thank you. Phil did have to leave, but he wanted uh, me to convey um, how much he values his partnership with the city uh, at um, 1313 Gallery 1313. Uh, and asked me to show things like the doors open uh, brochure, so I'm doing that um, on Phil's behalf. And obviously I'll be speaking to Gallery 1313 because they're a partner and tenant uh, in the building. So thank you, Mayor Tory, members of the Executive Committee. Uh, my name is Lorianne Gervin, and I am Senior Advisor for Social Purpose Real Estate at Artscape, a new role um, having previously served as COO. And in this role, I'm leading our work to oversee our commitment to renewing the existing mixed-use cultural assets that Artscape has created across the city, as well as supporting investment uh, in priority neighborhoods uh, outside the downtown core, such as in Weston, where we just opened up Artscape Weston Common. The Parkdale Arts and Cultural Center at 1313 Queen West is one of these public assets. Um, we're here today to speak to item 11.6, um, the Parkdale Hub, and uh, as Carla, we fully support the request to fund the phase two analysis and potential acquisition. 
As the partner operating 1313 Queen West for over 20 years, we have a strong stake in the neighborhood and want to ensure that the core values and spirit of Parkdale are upheld. Founded over 30 years ago, Artscape is an urban development organization that makes space for creativity and works to support positive transformation in communities. Our 14 projects in operation uniquely combine the range of spaces needed to ensure that arts and cultural opportunities for all um, uh, to deepen the impact of the Toronto arts sector and enrich the quality of life in our city. Our spaces include affordable live work, work studios for artists, office and program space for organizations, gallery and theater spaces, artist residency spaces and more. Three of Artscape's properties are in municipal assets that are no longer in use for their original civic purpose. All three are also heritage properties. So for example, Artscape Witchwood Barnes, which has a 50 year lease, and for which Artscape raised 23 million in capital support, uh, turned 10 this year. One of our oldest projects is in fact the Parkdale Arts and Cultural Center. And it's quite frankly, an extraordinary model of repurposing a civic asset, really representing best practice. Um, through community visioning and great design, it's mixed use with affordable housing and community space. So it was really ahead of its time and reflects the principles that the city is now aspiring to achieve on other city properties, particularly through the housing TO sites. Um, and indeed, we're delighted to, uh, to add our support to Queen Cowan also being included as a housing TO site. In 2016, Artscape reached out to set in motion a renewal of its 20-year lease at Parkdale Arts and Cultural Center. Recognizing that a 20-year term would not provide for the security of tenure needed to create a permanent community asset and attract investment in building renewal, Artscape requested a longer-term lease, or even a title transfer. Um, instead, the city responded with a five-year lease, initially under the emerging, emerging community space tenancy policy. Not surprisingly, we expressed concern that a vital community hub with affordable housing could be put into short-term tenancy. We reached out to then Build Toronto, Councillor Perks, the Affordable Housing Office, and others, and we learned that this timing aligned with a review of capital upgrades required in other city properties at Queen and Cowan, thus prompting the innovative idea championed by the Councillor to leverage 1313 Queen West, along with other city sites, to create increased and permanent affordable housing and community infrastructure. Artscape agreed to join preliminary coordination meetings based on three premises. That any future redevelopment would include a home for the residential and community tenants at 1313 Queen West. That the amount of live, work, and community space would meet and ideally exceed what is currently provided. And that a renewed lease would specify this commitment. After over two years, earlier this year, we at long last received a draft five-year lease. Um, we're grateful to the city for working through uh, some uh, awkward lease terms, including uh, getting us a one-year termination. However, the step does not overcome a core gap that the lease does not provide security of tenure or include the original bridging language commitment of a guarantee of space for non-residential partners. Therefore, although live work tenants have protection under the RTA municipal bylaws, Artscape and our community partners who have served the neighborhood from their home at 1313 since its opening, including uh, Cababayan, the BIA, and Gallery 1313, um, have no guarantee to date. Nevertheless, based on the potential to do more with the site, as well as the dedication of the councillor, our residents and partners have come to the table in consultations in good faith, open-minded, and focused on creating a Parkdale that embraces its inclusion, diversity, and creativity. And I do want to give a shout out to CreateTO Planning and the councillor's office, as well as our partner organizations like PNLT and Parkdale for incredible engagement. We're here today to wholeheartedly encourage you to support funding the phase two and additional site acquisition. This isn't easy. It means that our residential tenants who love their apartments could be relocated as new homes are designed. It means that our community partners who have tirelessly provided services in the neighborhood might have different space, both temporarily and permanently. Um, but we welcome the additional design work and planning that could translate the experiences of our Parkdale Arts and Cultural residents and community tenants into high quality live work homes for our nine current households. We would also advocate an additional 20 to 30 affordable units for artist-led families. Um, and we believe that the process could yield increased state-of-the-art community and office space, as well as permanent anchor gallery space for Gallery 1313 and anchor space for our two partners, the BIA and Kababayan. All right. On that note, I'll right. have to ask you to conclude. Okay, okay yes. Thank, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, are there questions of the deputy? Okay, hearing none, I'll thank you very much again for a very clear message and thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh
Back to Michael Rosenberg, who is first on the list, and who, uh, there we are. Mark, the Hub project. Okay. Thank so, um, you know, obviously the project will bring forth a lot of uh, important uh, facilities and um, mostly seems to, to fit in with scale. There were some issues with how the frontage would actually fit with the, the Parkdale um, uh, Queen Street plan, but I'm, I imagine that those can be worked out. Um, so my main real issue here is with um, how the project is structured, and I would suggest that there are a number of different uh, models that exist, um, and that the best one is uh, from, from the existing ones, I think it can be further improved upon, but, but from the existing ways that the, the, the city manages these kinds of facilities, the best one is the, the board of management type uh, plan that it exists under the Association of Community Centers. I would say that um, this also relates somewhat to the Etobicoke Center, which is, which is on the agenda, but, but I won't be here at that time. So I'll just say that that, that civic center approach is also important, um, and that the, the, the local board of management approach works. But the two methods that I think are not as applicable are the um, parks, forestry, and recreation running uh, things as recreation centers and then sort of fitting in a bit of a community center element. I don't think that works as well. Um, the other one that I think really doesn't work at all is, um, and this is what the term hub often means and which is why I'm, I'm concerned about the use of the term hub because I definitely don't want it to turn into this type of thing, which is the um, give it to an NGO and call them the lead or the head tenant and then let them figure out who else gets to use the space. I think that is the worst possible model and I really hope it doesn't go in that direction. Um, the, the, uh, I know that there seems to be some sense in the city that, that the AOCC model is kind of finished. They're grandfathered but we're not doing more of those. I would actually suggest that there are a number of projects under the city where new types of hubs are being considered, and at, at least as a first consideration, the AOCC model should be expanded. It should be the first choice for most of these new ones that you're considering. Um, and I would say that it's not without its problems, um, and the, the Civic Center one, which I also like as a model, is not without its problems, but those are the two best ones. And I'll just you know, mentioned that the, the, the two problems which are partially but not completely solved by the AOCC model um, are one is the struggle for power and politics that exists within, certainly within NGOs, which is why I would not go for that model at all. Um, but it still can exist to a certain extent with any kind of model that's based on a board. So that is something to be concerned about, that it does not completely eliminate that model, that problem, but doing it within an AOCC is definitely a better environment than doing it within an NGO. And the other problem, which is unfortunately endemic to the entire city, which is the over-policy, over-strategy, policy, procedure, um, processes that go on in the city as a whole. And while a, a management, local management board does provide some flexibility and freedom, I think it should be recognized that, that it's not necessarily the role, and this is you know, a broader context thing, but in my opinion, it's not necessarily the role of the city to have a policy on everything and to try to make everybody run according to the policy. So. Uh, a, a board of management certainly helps, but, but the more that that can be sort of set outside of the city's policy frameworks, to me that's more of an advantage than a disadvantage. I know that the common attitude would be, but if you set something outside of the policy frameworks, then the policies won't be followed, the policies are good, not following them is bad, bad things will happen. I would say that actually policies are, we have too many policies, and the more things we can provide more flexibility on 
and freedom for people to just organize and do things their own ways, that's actually better. So I see the AOCC model as a step in the right direction, but the more that can be done to not make it like an NGO and not make it like a city, that that would be even better. Thank you. Mr. Rosenberg, uh, are there any questions of the deputy? Okay, hearing that all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, next, we had uh, Jared Epp and uh, Jared Epp. Good afternoon, sir. You have uh, five minutes, and then there may be a question or two. Hey, thank you. I'm, I'm reading uh, on behalf of Lindsay Manicum from Parkdale Project Reed, who couldn't be here. And I'm also uh, a Park, uh, resident of Parkdale, and I uh, currently live a block from the proposed uh, Parkdale hub. And uh, as a father of two children, living close by, I fully support this project going forward. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to speak before the Executive Committee on behalf of Parkdale Project Reed, a community-based literacy center serving the Parkdale neighborhood for over 30 years. Parkdale Project Read is a learner-centered, trauma-informed organization that builds a range of literacy skills, knowledge, and competencies to support adults in their efforts to gain personal independence, expand their employment opportunities, and or pursue further education. Since our founding by Dr. Rita Cox in the Parkdale Public Library in the 1980s, our work has been firmly rooted in the Parkdale neighborhood and its diverse communities. Over the years, we have collaborated with, supported, and been supported by countless individuals and organizations who recognize the essential value of community literacy. Unfortunately, like many local organizations, we have felt the rising pressures of gentrification and commercial development in Parkdale. We are currently surviving on a month-to-month -month lease at King and Dufferin, an, inter an inter intersection undergoing massive transformation and development to make way for luxury condominiums. Meanwhile, our sibling organizations in Parkdale, and frankly across the city, are being squeezed out by rising rents, sudden evictions, and a culture of social service austerity that disregards the needs and desires of vulnerable and underserved communities. In our view, the proposed Parkdale Hub presents a critical opportunity to reclaim space, resources, and visibility for the organizations and community resources that have always supported the health, safety, and success of all Parkdale residents, not just those who can afford prime real estate. As a community literacy organization, Parkdale Project Read is an essential com a companion to the Parkdale Library and Masaryk Cowan Center. Our programs and services empower learners to advocate for themselves and contribute fully to building a sustainable community in Parkdale. As Parkdale continues to change, it is vital that city planners and private developers negotiate with and earnestly support the people and services that sustain this neighborhood. Securing and preserving permanent, dedicated space for community organizations is one of the most important aspects of this work. Many learners and community members describe Parkdale Project Read as a home away from home, a second living room, a much needed sanctuary. These feelings are, of course, about more than four walls and a roof, but space is the anchor from which we build connections, deepen relationships, and sustain our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions of the deputy? I thank you very much uh, for your uh, comments, Mr. Rep. Uh, Mercedes Sharp Zayas. I hope I pronounced that close to properly. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You have five minutes. Okay. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mercedes Sharp Zayas, and I work for the Parkdale People's Economy along with Carla. Um, as she mentioned, we are a network of over 30 different community based organizations, many of whom are currently housed within the proposed community hub, as well as hundreds of residents fighting for economic, racial, and climate justice in Parkdale. I'm here today to voice my support for the feasibility study of the community hub and wanted to raise a specific focus on the need for deeply affordable housing and the expansion of social ownership on public lands. In 2016, the Parkdale People's Economy launched the Parkdale Community Planning Study, which was an 18-month participatory planning process that was deeply embedded in community visions for well-being, shared wealth, and equitable development. Within one of the core areas for community action and policy, we identified uh, that there was the 
publicly owned assets uh, within the corner of Queen and Cowan, which had a significant opportunity to bolster social infrastructure through a community hub. We were thrilled when this opportunity was championed by the local councillor, Gord Perks, and approved by council. Yet the community had big dreams for this site, dreams that exceeded the limits of what's traditionally been created within community hubs or even in the city's current housing models. This was the dream of 100% social housing on public lands. The creation of affordable housing on this site was seen as a critical measure uh, for the city to address the housing crisis through the lens of housing as a human right. We were uh, inspired by examples of actually what's been done elsewhere here within the city, uh, such as the example of the Stanley Knowles Co-op in North York, which was granted 50-year air rights lease by the library to build 15 stories of affordable housing. So you can only imagine our awe when this dream, which at times had been dampened to keep our expectations realistic, uh, was incorporated into the vis visioning sessions for the community hub. Concerted investment in the hub-based model, we believe, will create huge opportunity for coordinated strategy to address community benefits, such as deeply uh, needed community space, affordable housing, and decent work in Parkdale. Therefore, I wanted to voice my strong support for the recommendations, especially in terms of the acquisition of additional lands for public use and the funding necessary to build these visions. I would add a slight caveat, though, which challenges the Housing Now model, uh, which is to follow the community's de demands for there to be 100% social housing. As we know, Parkdale is a neighborhood that is deeply impacted by poverty. A third of community members are low income and 20% rely on social assistance, where the city's current uh, definition of affordable housing falls far out of reach. 90% of South Parkdale residents are renters, meaning that displacement pressures are incredibly high as we see rents continue to rise. So there are opportunities to build bold new visions through collaborative models with municipal, provincial, and federal funding, alternative finance mechanisms, and partnerships with social housing providers, such as cooperatives, social housing providers, uh, like so supportive housing providers, indigenous provi housing providers, and the broad for broader nonprofit sector. Yet none of these partnerships would lead to transformative changes unless they do center the leadership of equity-seeking community members in the decision-making and the development of these visions. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there uh, questions of the deputy? Cut. Oh, no, any questions? No? Okay. Going once, going once. Thank you so much for your patience in uh, waiting to speak with us. Okay. Uh, was there anybody else that uh, wanted to be heard on this issue that uh, wasn't registered here? I think we heard from everybody that was listed on 11.6, and that would move us along then to questions of staff. Are there questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, then uh, we could move along to speakers. And uh, would you like to speak first, Councillor Perks? Sure. Just um, I'll, I'll just take a, a moment or two of your time to give you a, a, a bit of a feel for what's going on here. So the report in front of you uh, really does three things. It sets aside some resources for further project design and consultation, uh, specifically getting it ready for. Uh, us being able to come in with a rezoning application, which obviously requires a bunch of work. Uh, secondly, it, it directs uh, Create TO to continue to lead work on this project uh, as leading a number of different city divisions in that con 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 conversation and directing them to include many of the people that you heard from today in a consultative way to design the project, lay out what its different elements are going to be. And finally, it directs staff to enter into negotiations uh, with a property owner, and that's described in your uh, in-camera in portion of your report. And should those negotiations uh, be successful, to report back uh, for council to approve it. So you're not approving a purchase today, you're directing staff to do a negotiation, and if we get to yes, to come back, and I'm assured by the CFO who's not in the room, but the city manager is nodding, so I'll make him take it, give his word on it, that we will be able to find a funding source at that time. Um, by way of background, you heard a piece of it today. Uh, Artscape, their lease on a portion of this site ran out. At the same time, the community centre there, Masaryk Cowan, uh, was scheduled to do a major 
uh, repairs and renovations to the building. And within the 10-year capital plan, the local library branch, which is at the same intersection as the other two properties, uh, was scheduled to get a fairly serious piece of work done there. And I became aware all these pieces were going to happen at the same time, and it, it occurred to me, um, why would you do each of these as a separate capital project? Why wouldn't you try to see if there are efficiencies available by tying all the work together? And with the help of Councillor Thompson, uh, I brought a motion to Council directing uh, city staff, at that time it was Social Development Finance Administration leading it, to pull together all the different uh, departments in the City of Toronto who need and use space in working with the community to see if they had an interest in this project, whether they were there currently or not. At one point, Shelter Housing and Support was looking at maybe putting uh, some shelter space here, but the timing turned out not to be right for them. Other departments that don't currently operate there are, are expressing some interest in maybe partnering on an expanded site. You should know there are, within the city-owned facilities there, uh, the Parkdale Library, for example, which is the busiest branch library in the city of Toronto, um, work with, provide homes to a variety of community groups. You've heard from uh, a representative who was speaking on behalf of Cababayan, which is a, a Filipino settlement organization. That's one of 22 different community organizations that currently lease space or have shared space agreements with the City of Toronto in the different facilities here. There is also a TPA lot, and nearby there's a Toronto Community Housing property. We're looking at maybe whether the parking garage under the TPA, under the TCHC building, could take the TPA and free up the surface parking lot as part of this. It's a fantastic example of pieces of the city trying to work together. And because of that, when the mayor decided that we would bring all the real estate functions together under Create TO, they came to me and said, this would be a remarkable proof of concept of what we're trying to do with, our, with bringing together all the different real estate pieces in the city to find those synergies and efficiencies. So given all that, today we're finished the first piece of work which was to consult with the community and all the different agencies and tenants and city departments we have a rough massing of what we want to do and you're being asked give us the money to do the second stage look at a purchase and direct create to to continue the conversation with city community agencies and community members i encourage you to support this Thanks, uh, Councillor Perks. Are there others uh, wishing to speak? Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I certainly want to thank uh, Councillor Perks for um, his leadership on this uh, particular matter. I know how important it was to him. I'm sure what's happening there. Um, and, and how important it was to him, and we're hearing from his community, how important it is to him and the community, and they're here to speak uh, in support. Um, and I want to say that um, uh, I support this uh, um, request wholeheartedly. The process is, um, is one in which um, all of the moving parts are being um, looked at, and it's uh, looking at consolidation and so on. I have two hubs in my ward, and I can tell you the significance of them. They're extremely valuable to all the different community groups and organizations and agency and so on. And often it's, it's a matter of space for uh, people to gather, to convene, and to have um, that uh, assurance that they can um, thrash through and sort out community problems and trying to identify some of the challenges and so on and the opportunity that it brings. But it also gives people a real um, uh, and it's a rare situation in which they have the ability to use space for the intended purposes and you see the benefits. Uh, the first hub in my ward is the Brimley and uh, Ellesmere hub. 
We have a medical facility in there. We have a dental facility in there. We have a cooking facility helping residents with uh, diabetes. We have a variety of other elements. And in fact, one of the things that we did was that they worked and of course, with the United Way's help, um, work with the owner of the property and uh, dug down and created um, extensive space in that initial um, uh, structure. Uh, most recently, we opened up a, um, a, a lounge for young people there, a facility to help them to come in, to meet, and to talk, and to share, and to kind of work through some of the challenges. Um, and the benefit that has come from that community, it's, it's uh, complete metamorphosis have taken place because what has happened was, whereas it was once a more depressed area, it's more vibrant, it's more lively, there's more activities, more that's taking place and the benefits to the community is, is, is quite s uh, significant. You see the utility just watching people in satisfaction that comes. The second one is the um, uh, Kennedy um, uh, hub uh, at uh, 1911 Kennedy Road. Uh, just two weeks ago, we used that hub. We were working with the residents in the Glamorgan and Antrim uh, area to set up a resident-led, community-driven initiative to provide uh, opportunities to address some of the issues around violence and some of the challenges that uh, the residents are here are having. We have a food bank in there. We are able to provide services to more residents and so on, and again, space, which is such an important element for residents to be able to utilize. And so this process as part of the feasibility, and I, I can't wait to see it actually come to realization. It's something that we're gonna, we have to do. It's something that we must do because it's necessary. And if we don't do it, we will see and, and have, uh, as, as we're seeing in er other areas, not across, uh, if you will, the pond. Uh, I look at certain areas in France where there's some huge challenges in terms of new people coming in and trying to settle and don't have the amenities and so on. I look at areas in, in Montreal and other areas like that where they're challenged because there isn't that investment into community and creating the space and creating uh, an environment that allow residents to be able to, um, uh, to, con to, to come together and to build on what are the fundamental tools of uh, success, but to engage the residents who help them to, uh, to do more for themselves. So fully support this and uh, can't wait to see the hub opening and to provide for the residents the needed space in order to allow them to be able to be empowered because I think that's part of the facilitation of having a hub in a community. So looking forward to supporting this, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And thank you again, Councillor. And thank the community as well, of course. Others, thanks, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Others to speak? Okay, may I, may I just say on this, uh, I really just echo the comments of uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Thompson. And, uh, you know, I think it, it, there's, a, as the Councillor knows uh, better than I, there's a, a huge interest in, in what is an incredibly interesting but also incredibly well located neighborhood. And that often produces two byproducts. I mean, one is uh, that there are increased service demands that come from just the change that's taking place in the neighborhood and uh, so on. And secondly, um, there's the risk always that, uh, and I think we've seen it uh, to some extent, of the pushing out of some of the supports and the people um, who are uh, there before all that interest came along from others. And so it creates the need for something like a hub. We've learned this before. We've seen the success of it before. And this is, as Councillor Perks put it so well, it's a, it's, it's a sort of a perfect, uh, not that we need that many more tests because I think we're seeing it begin to work, a test case though for Create TO in the context of it taking all of these, I won't call them disparate, all of these separate departments and landowners and operators and people who are many of them in the public domain and bring them together and fashion out of that something that I think will be uh, truly special so I just you know if you look at the amount of money that's involved to take this the next step it's relatively modest before before any talk of an acquisition uh, but I just uh, uh, you know want to assure him that I think as has been the case with other instances where we've looked at acquisitions uh, we didn't always have it um, you know money set aside for because we didn't always know exactly what we we're going to do but I think in this case we will find what we need to find uh, in order to as the city manager has said in order to make this happen because I think it's something in a neighborhood that you know richly deserves it we've heard uh, the evidence of that from people who came to speak which also shows the value of the deputations and even though we didn't have a lot of questions for them that's because I think we understood what they're saying is true uh, so in any event I'm also very supportive of this and onward it goes and uh, I, 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 I if I was in a 
position to ask you questions. Now I'm not. I just saw the Q2 2020, and I always, when I see that, as, as the city manager knows, I always ask a question about that and push back a little bit and say, couldn't we do it any faster? But I guess uh, Create Teal will do its work as fast as it can, and uh, we'll take it from there. So, okay. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, we're going to move the recommendation, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. All right. All those in favor? Moved by Deputy Mayor Thompson. Opposed? Carried. Very good. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to 11.7, EX 11.7, and uh, it was held for a deputant, and that deputant is Hamish Wilson, and there he is uh, taking his place. Thank you very much. And uh, you know the rules here, five minutes, and there may be a question or two. Uh, thank you for your uh, welcome and punctuality in returning to uh, the committee room at lunch, uh, Mayor Tory. Um, this particular issue I'm ambivalent on. Uh, the land itself and everything, it's probably really valuable, uh, including the air rights. It may be an old core asset. I'm not sure of the history of how the Union Station was built and uh, who gave the land and what level of taxpayer uh, coughed up to build it. I do hope that we will respect the taxpayers. Certainly it's uh, like the Union Station itself, this deal is kind of complicated and the situation is complicated as well. I'm certainly not opposed to expropriation at times. Uh, I think it's very, very helpful and overdue in some instances, such as, such as out at uh, Dundas uh, West in Keele. And perhaps we also need to do such things out at Maine and Danforth as well to uh, uh, improve the interconnectivity between uh, the GO and the uh, TTC. So on one hand, yes, we should cooperate and do as the recommendation suggests to not uh, uh, fuss at all. GO is very helpful to Toronto, uh, especially the core. Um, this uh, roughly shows just the degree to which uh, the GO brings in a lot of people into the core, the gardener less so much, the TTC does the heavy lifting. And this particular chart shows just the incredible result of the incremental intensification and improvement that GO has done over the years in terms of bringing in uh, the, the, the many thousands of people that we have. Uh, so GO's done an awful lot of good work for us, and yet it's also uh, sometimes a bit challenged, um, but, uh, but on the positive of, of yes, cooperating, I can see why the, uh, the Metrolinx GO wants to take it away from the city, because sometimes uh, the city's slow, to inept, to unwise, to even uh, stupid, dare I say it, on some of our priorities, um, and it's at least going to be for a transit usage. That's great. It's not that uh, uh, going to be a parking lot or anything. And so on the no side of let's not cooperate particularly, again, e even though it's a linear strip, it's got, got to have a, a high, uh, high value. I'm worried about the goal uh, and Metrolink's lack, relative lack of accountability. And there are some issues with how GO is performed as well. Presto, uh, they're slow on the, uh, the, uh, the expropriation, uh, the linkage between Dundas West and, and Keel. And uh, uh, there was also an issue, I believe, about uh, difference in platform heights at Union Station. Uh, and it'd be nice if they wanted to take something else uh, that's linear, just very, very nearby to this particular uh, strip of land and say uh, give two of six of those lanes to a busway or something. Uh, it'd be great if they, you could somehow manage to uh, work in the gardener uh, with this particular expropriation package uh, because we do need to have uh, more transit because the Union Station is getting to be brittle, uh, noted in this uh, Rapid uh, Transit in Toronto book, and uh, for anybody that actually uses it as well, uh, it's getting to the point where we really need to deconcentrate the, uh, uh, the intensity of usage, and that's not necessarily in the plans. Uh, so in terms of going for, and I'd like to, you know, a leverage point, uh, for, for saying no is that I'd really like to have information about why we can't increase the usage of the Richmond Hill goal line uh, quickly to uh, avoid the need for that uh, young extension in particular um, because it, it seems like it's an obvious way to actually take train loads of people off the Young Street subway which again is brittle. Uh, we need that sub-regional -re relief. So if, if we're doing a, a, a cooperation 
uh, negotiation thing, I really wish we could actually like uh, maybe do a swap out of resources so it isn't necessarily cash that's transferring or land for land as an example of what cooperation might, might lead uh, to. Um, this is from an old plan. Uh, there's such intense demand coming in from this pinch point here at base, the base of High Park. We haven't done this Front Street uh, transit way or a roadway, but on the north side of the Western tracks, I think there's enough room for at least a single track, and I'd like to introduce an idea that if we looped the streetcar, like did a loop, uh, of a reversible Jarvis style transit way and only transit way on the north side from Queen or even King into and reintroduce transit onto Front Street. This would actually be a really helpful thing to increase our resiliency and uh, the e efficiency of the network. Uh, that's just, uh, you know, and, and it got modeled out. Here's a better, better sense of what could be done. You can send the vehicles back out on Queen or King as well. That's the sort of thing that where we've had cooperation, uh, instead of money, that would be really helpful. There are other, other uh, options. The last one. Uh, uh, yep, other options, I think, uh, swapping out the half mile uh, spur line with the uh, rail trail up there to try and get relief, uh, surface relief and squeeze the billions. So. Uh, You'll do what you'll do. Our uh, Doug Tater will do what he will do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Other uh, questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that was the only deputant on that item, 11.7. Uh, the next uh, issue would be whether there's any questions of staff. All right, uh, speakers. Uh, otherwise, we have Councillor Nunziata moving the recommendation. And uh, I'll ask for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Eleven. Yeah, I just uh, point away. I was just thinking we sh really should thank staff. I mean, this is actually a good um, example of staff being engaged and wanting to facilitate and allow us to be able to at least cover, cover our legal position. I would say. So thank That's you. It's a nice way of putting cover our legal position. Yes. yes. But uh, no, and I think it's something that yes, uh, the concept of friendly uh, friendly expropriation is. Uh, so we can am very... we can amend the motion by thanking staff. Indeed. Thank you very much to all concerned. And uh, that was carried. And then we move next to uh, 11.12, uh, which is the um, Rexdale uh, Woodbine Community Benefits Update. And we have uh, a deputy there, uh, Rosemary Powell from the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Thank you very much for coming and your patience. And you have five minutes. So uh, my name is Rosemary Powell, the Executive Director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Tory, and members of the Executive Committee. Um, we'd like to start off by thanking the City for bringing forward this report and the support that the City has shown throughout the entire year with the Casino Woodbine Project and the working groups in leading the implementation of the Community Benefits Agreement. So in 2018, our network members were active in supporting the Rexdale Rising campaign a local initiative to secure a binding CBA for the Woodbine Casino and entertainment expansion in Rexdale. We also continued to monitor the agreement as one of the representatives at the Community Steering Committee. Uh, to date, the TCBN is pleased, it's nice to say that, um, to see the results of the Casino Woodbine CBA. We recognize the efforts of the One Toronto Gaming that they've taken to work with the city, unions, and local employment agencies to reduce barriers and support candidates' preparation into jobs and opportunities at Woodbine. Uh, moving forward, we'd like to see this level of collaboration to meet the obligations of other areas of the CBA, which includes a new child care facility and local procurement. Uh, we did want to highlight one area of concern in today's deputation. Uh, we feel that the city's definition of social hire uh, is very broad and it does not reflect the deep-rooted history of residents in Rexdale particularly. The city defines social hire as Aboriginal peoples, persons with disabilities, racialized groups, invisible minorities, women, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, two-spirit communities, undocumented individuals, newcomers, immigrants and refugees, persons with low income and youth. Basically saying that this is quite a broad definition that would probably reach about 80% of the population of Toronto. Uh, so while we agree that it is important to track and monitor aggregated hiring data, 
we would like to see a more targeted approach to support those who need employment opportunities the most. For example, we know that youth from specific demographics face multiple barriers to employment. Uh, we would like to see this reflected in the hiring process to ensure that these candidates are prioritized and are given the necessary support to help them to succeed. Um, we acknowledge the emphasis the city staff have indicated on ensuring construction apprenticeships are accessible and available to local youth, as well as indigenous peoples and youth from specific equity-seeking groups in Rexdale. Similarly, we would like to see this approach extended to operational positions as well. So at the TCBN, we have seen the impact that the community benefits opportunities on projects like this can have on the city's most marginalized residents. These opportunities provide a foot in the door to a well-paying unionized career, which we first uh, hand have seen change lives and families in the city. Uh, we look forward to continuing the work with the City of Toronto Gaming uh, and One Toronto Gaming to take full advantage of this opportunity to support Toronto residents and especially for those who need it most. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, and uh, are there some questions of the deputy? Deputy Mayor Thompson. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Ms. Fell, you've indicated that you're happy. It's, yes. Uh, probably the first time I've seen you happy. <laughs> respect to that smile. What's making you happy? Well, you, uh, what we saw right off the bat, um, you know, after uh, City Council's leadership in really bringing this uh, community benefits agreement uh, into place, is that the City of Toronto staff took this extremely seriously. And One Toronto Gaming, uh, they actually developed a tool, a self-declaration tool, for individuals to be able to self-identify as being a part of uh, one of the equity-seeking groups. And that was very important because it had always been a challenge with the other community benefits programs that we had in place, uh, figuring out, uh, you know, who are we really targeting here to make sure uh, that we're really getting to those people who need uh, this, uh, you know, these opportunities the most. So we really like that. Would I be correct to say that the staff, the City of Toronto staff, were the, I'll use the term, the glue in terms of bringing the community and uh, the one Toronto Casino together in order to ensure that the challenges that you and your organization were experiencing and the doubts that you had, because you had doubts yes. through the conversation. So would I be correct in saying that they played a tremendous or focal role in ensuring that we are where we are here today? Let me just take a look over there to the staff <laughs> who's been leading this and to say, yes, you've played a tremendous role in really supporting and making sure that the work uh, continues uh, uh, effectively month over month. So thank you very much. And of course, the leadership of the City of Toronto in really establishing firm targets on the Community Benefits Agreement was also very important to make sure that there was an imperative uh, for one Toronto Gaming to actually follow through. Um, the daycare, you mentioned daycare. Um, it's essential that the daycare be in the catchment area, would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, we, were, we, were, we are having some challenges, or perhaps we were having some challenges with respect to potential location. Are you aware of that? I am aware of that, and it's something that we would like to see accelerated as best as possible. I know that city staff have explained that there are some, uh, you know, alternatives or interim, uh, you know, services that are in place to support. But uh, you know, we'd like to see that uh, move forward as uh, as quickly as possible. Because this would be a definite benefit to the people in the catchment area, and so you need to have it located there. Absolutely. Uh, we know that Rexdale is one of the communities across Toronto that has the least accessibility in terms of uh, daycare spaces, and it needs to be close enough to work that people can actually benefit from. And so just my final question to you, you talk a little bit about the social hire and our broad definition and so on. Yeah. So if we have a broad definition, obviously it's not broad enough because I think that's the point you're raising that it's, it, it's, it sounded pretty broad to me in terms of the list that you uh, portrayed, but how is it that it's hampering young people and uh, I thought that I heard you say racialize or marginalize young people. How is it not capturing them as such? The challenge is that it's a catch-all that captures everyone. So if you look at that list, practically anyone in the city of Toronto except for a white middle-aged male uh, would actually count 
as being a part of the, uh, the, the targeted groups for this program. So we potentially leave some people out that we need to capture in as it's part of the hiring process because it's so broad? It's so broad, it, it, that's right. So everyone counts and so therefore you don't get to really focus in on the, you know, the, the, the youth who are racialized, black youth, like we know who are the people who are facing the most higher levels of unemployment in our city. We should focus on making sure that those are uh, reached first and then we can drill down to the others for sure. We want employment for all, good jobs for all, but let's focus in on those who could actually benefit from the opportunities the most and put programs and supports in place to make sure that they're getting uh, access to those opportunities. Great, thank you. No more questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Mayor Thompson. Other uh, questions of the deputy? Okay, well, seeing none, I'll thank you very much for your uh, deputation and for your answers to the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the only deputation on this matter, so that it then leaves us uh, at uh, questions to staff. Yes, uh, Councillor Anciana. Yes, questions to staff. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to expand a bit on the daycare because that was my question. So it, it seems that we, we can't find a suitable location um, because originally it was supposed to be off, <clears throat> off site, correct? And so is that the reason? Uh, through the chair, I can respond to that. So the child care center will be located off site of the casino proper. Right. Um, we have been working in the community. We've looked at a number of locations. Uh, recently, uh, we've toured two locations that have significant promise and we're pursuing the site plan uh, proposal from the landlords. So it's looking promising um, and we're making some progress in locating a space. So you're at the point of with the site plan, so you are in the process of negotiating? Just beginning that process, yes. Beginning that process. Okay, um, and so in, uh, in attachment four, the total number of um, completed respo uh, responses that you received on as far as the hours in that, is that, is that also going to be an issue for um, the daycare? Uh, the, we have as been far as the We've been talking to the community at, uh, through surveys and through engagement right. about their preferred hours. Yeah. To date, um, the most of the responses coming back are looking for 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is typical childcare hours, although there has been some interest in ev uh, evening and weekend care. So once we get further along, we have a location, we'll determine what's feasible in terms of the childcare center operating and viability. There'd have to be enough demand to keep the center open um, on weekends, weekends and evenings. On weekends, yeah. That's right. Because that was one of the responses. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nunziata. Other, yes, Councillor Deputy Mabayla. Thank you. I, I, I actually want to go right where Councillor Nunziata was. And uh, so I was under the impression that we were trying to have the daycare in the facility where the hotels and the uh, casino in that area there was going to be. Is that, that not, that's not the case? Through the chair, no, that's not the case. There was agreement early on that having the childcare located in the casino or on the same property um, would not be suitable. But there was, there was hotel, there was uh, facilities around. Is this because of the zoning? issue or is it what what is this because this is employment zoning that we're not considering the hotel the the, the daycare closer to because that we pushed hard as a community benefit because we saw this as a major thing for the workers of the hotels and the casinos this was a community benefit to actually um, get rid of some of the barriers that we know are for those workers to work in the casino to work in the hotel and especially for parents that have young children so is this a zoning issue that we have to take it completely out of the, the area or? Yeah, uh, through, through the chair, um, no, it's not a zoning issue. Okay. Wherever we locate it will have to be zoned appropriate for childcare. It was about appropriateness of having a childcare facility located right on the casino premises. So what was agreed is that the childcare would be in the uh, vicinity, but not directly on site. And it would serve both the employees of the casino, but also the residents of the community. Okay. 
And when you say vicinity, what are we talking about? A kilometer, 500 meters, 200 meters? Three kilometers, um, what is it? Mm -hmm. uh, about pro approximately two kilometers. So I have to, I work at the casino, work at the hotel, and I have to drop off my kid and walk two kilometers to get to work? Yeah, that's, that's the reality, okay. And the hours, you're saying that you are um, uh, doing surveys and doing all that. Again, the, the casino's not there, the hotel workers are not there. So, I mean, you're interviewing, I guess, the residents that live in the neighborhood, that most of them don't have hotel hours or shifts or those things. So how are we taking in consideration the needs of some of the people that we wanted to ensure that the daycare was going to be there for? Through the chair, there is a community steering committee that's been established. Children's Services sits on that, as does One Toronto Gaming and Casino Woodbine. There are also representatives from commu local community organizations and the neighborhoods. And this issue is brought up at our quarterly meeting. So there's actually ample opportunity to uh, benefit from the uh, insight and needs of the people around that table. I, I, I just want to make sure that there's enough. I mean, it, it concerns me when you're saying that it's recommended from 7 a.m. to 6 a.m. when a hotel workers and all these people are, it's going to be 24-7. So if you have the night shift, what do you do? Or, I mean, the whole intention of putting this daycare as a community benefit network was actually to help us to eliminate one of the barriers that we know exists for people to work in this sector. So to be clear, uh, we haven't recommended that those are the hours. That's the interest that we're receiving back from the surveys and from the uh, engagement that we're doing. Um, there, the possibility of having extended hours has not been eliminated. That will be part of the conversation with the child care operator once they are selected. And again, really it comes down to demand and viability. There has to be enough demand for the operator to remain open. Um, they have to pay staff, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that that's not going to happen. At this point, there's not a great deal of interest, but we'll consider, we'll continue to consider that as we go through the process to select an operator. So if the demand is not there, as you're selecting your operator, will the opportunity to have that, because I, I think as you start to, we'll start to have more and more workers, that demand might increase. So are you considering an operator that will leave the door open to respond to that demand? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, all right, uh, are there other, Deputy Mayor Thompson, questions? Um, can you help me to understand the geography of the area? Um, the Woodbine racetrack is sort of bordered on the Malton, Mississauga to the east. On the north side, you have um, basically a few condos, townhouse. Further to the north, you have Humber College. And immediately north of that, you have the Woodbine um, uh, Mall. And to the uh, east of that, you have a um, uh, grocery store um, southeast going towards um, 401, 427. You have a few strip plazas and so on. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So within that context of that area, there is not a lot of um, facilities around to locate a, a daycare facility within one kilometer, I guess the closest is the two kilometer radius that you're talking about? There is a lot of rules, regulations, and guidelines related to the existing set of properties. So I was going to get that, but go ahead. Okay. The partnership has been working with realtors, other um, property owners within the area, basically looking at ev the school boards, looking at every option to find the best, closest, most suitable option for the daycare location. Right. And the two sites that you have looking at now, is certainly one is more preferable. Um, those are at least within, they're in, within the catchment area first and foremost, is that, is that correct? 
That is correct. And um, you have the ability now, which you really didn't have before, two specific locations. One you prefer that you could potentially reach an agreement to accommodate the daycare uh, within um, the catchment area. That's correct. Failing that, you have to move out of the catchment area. Yes, if the, it, I mean, you don't I do, want to do. No, which we don't want to do because it won't uh, meet the needs as directly of residents and employees. Right. Um, might it be possible for um, the gaming facilities to set up some type of, um, of uh, transportation system to be able to accommodate and, and, and allow for users of the daycare to get to the facilities? Because the facility is quite large, right? So in as much as, um, let's say, the central building off the uh, Woodbine facilities is located at some distance away. If you were to really measure out from the areas that you're looking at to uh, the, um, the, 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 the Woodbine race facility, it's probably closer than two kilometers away. Would, would you not agree? Yes, we believe so. Right, and so it's a matter of working out the dynamics and all of the elements. First and foremost, to the question that uh, Councilor and Deputy Mayor Bilo asked about, um, uh, when the facilities would be open and available to the users and so on. That's something, a process you'd be working through? Yes, that's correct. Right, and my office was uh, helpful to connect you with uh, a potential site in the area. We were able to work with you and even work with the owner around numbers and so on in terms of bringing them down from the level of stratosphere where they were yes your office was helpful and in and, and helping us make those connections and um, starting that conversation and are you happy with respect to the process in which you're going we are we have uh, visited two sites as recently as yesterday uh, one of them has real potential so we're going to pursue that and have you have uh, had a similar example with at least one or, or of the two sites where you've been able to convert those sites in order to make it uh, uh, acceptable and, 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 and feasible for a daycare facility? That's correct. You have some experience and track record. That's correct. When we go and tour the sites, that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Are there other questions of staff? Okay, are there speakers uh, on the, uh, the issue? Deputy Mayor Bailao, thank you. Um, well, it's great to see this program working, and I think it just means that we need to do it more often and in other projects. Um, I um, I'm happy to see the results. I'm looking forward to continue to follow it and improve it. Um, I, I do think there's two things that came out of this, and it, it doesn't have necessarily to do uh, with the uh, community benefits agreement that we got for Woodbine. One of it is with the location of the daycare. And this actually came uh, from an item that we had yesterday at planning and housing, uh, where um, I uh, asked planning to, the, we are reviewing now the use of the census, sensitive uses in employment areas, both in core and general. And sometimes uh, we r rule out things like uh, daycares and long-term care homes and all these facilities and employment areas. And most of them need to be ruled out because they create pressures. But I've uh, asked staff and what I was concerned that this was going to be one of those cases, especially when it has to do with daycare. I think daycare can be very, very complementary in certain part, certain employment areas, especially when it's in the periphery and in the general area. And so I just wanted to make sure that this was not a, one of those cases that we were not going to miss the opportunity of actually supporting our workers with something that they need because of a zoning issue. And I've asked planning to, as they're doing that review, to ensure that that happens because I think more and more uh, as the city is becoming more complex and the pressure on parents gets bigger and bigger where we locate these daycares and where we locate these things need to be integrated in our where people are going to go work it's that facilitates those things and I think that our planning and zoning tools need to uh, accommodate for that um, and the other thing is that I, I hope that as we are 
uh, ensuring that the um, operator for the daycare that we have, so I understand that the, the man needs to be there and I understand you don't have the workers there still to, to have the conversations with them and you don't know how many of them will have to have kids, but it is really, really important that uh, we leave space in that contract to accommodate the demand. Uh, I was the one that put the motion to have the daycare, put it, pushed hard for it, and the intent that we had for this and the work that was done with the community uh, benefits network was to support the workers because I remember in many, many instances, for example, at TCHC that we have similar programs, many people, and in this case, truth be told, many women tell me that one of the issues that they have uh, to enter into some of these programs is the daycares don't open early enough for, for example, them to enter into some of the trade programs and something like this. So we don't want to be creating these opportunities and then have obstacles that prevent prevent them from taking advantage of these opportunities. These have to go hand in hand. So I hope that as the daycare opens, understanding all the complexities that, you know, that the operator needs to have, that we negotiate a contract that accommodates these needs and accommodates to fulfill this, uh, the role that was first intended to, to do. So again, thank you to the staff. Thanks to everybody involved. I think we, amazing work has been done and proven that we can do it again, but uh, let's just keep these two issues in mind. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Thompson. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I fully agree with Deputy Mayor Bailao, and uh, certainly all of us have played a role in terms of uh, this particular process. I want to thank uh, the staff, and certainly I want to thank Rosemary and the uh, CBN and, and everyone who has uh, stepped up. I remember uh, not too long ago, um, not necessarily feeling really encouraged that. Um, we would be able to be see a day like this where we've arrived at a sweet spot where all of the elements have merged and there is uh, full unanimity in, in, unanimity in terms of an agreement and so on and that um, we were able to kind of look and see the big picture what the challenges were and what the opportunities were we were able to um, obviously come to a point where um, uh, responding to a need in an area that's challenged and I think that the point that Rosemary has made that said that you know our social definition is so broad that we tend to capture everyone and it's as much as uh, obviously it's well intended as, as an administration or a government we want to be able to help and create a level playing field and fairness sometimes though that that uh, that attempt seems to have the adverse impact and affect uh, those who we least want to affect. And so I think we have to find ways to uh, amend and, and adjust uh, the elements so that we capture um, the people that we need to capture to help them, to empower them, and so on. We uh, have gone through a number of iteration with respect to Woodbine. Woodbine Lives was, was going to be the great savior and all the things that was going to happen. Then it just kind of fizzed out. and. The folks, uh, I believe, from Boston pulled away and the investment were there and now we have uh, some gaming facilities and we are you, you gaming operator to operate there and we are going to use, obviously, this um, uh, process of gaming for community benefit and engaging to create opportunities. The daycare piece was a piece that um, we knew and, and uh, recognize is extremely important, uh, certainly to the community and um, uh, to us as uh, government and uh, to the uh, CBN group and so on. And uh, we have, you know, come to a point where we're able to at least have some options. Uh, weeks ago, we had no options basically available to us. There was nothing uh, we couldn't afford, and. Uh, the location of the Woodbine um, uh, facility, it's very challenging in terms of uh, finding the appropriate um, uh, site for daycare there. And so we have some options now, and I'm looking forward to that coming forward. Uh, clearly, uh, it's a work in progress, right? It's not a static, done deal. There's a lot of things that are happening. We have the elements, the moving parts. Uh, they're all working, and, and uh, there is a, uh, an attitude of wanting to work together to uh, establish um, all the principles that needs to ensure that this uh, facility is going to work for the community, work for the workers, 
work for obviously the operators and work for the city as well as part of um, this is uh, as I understand it, the very first time we're actually putting this structure together to allow it work this um, community uh, benefit network and it's uh, it's coming along quite well and of course I'm sure we'll be using this model in other things that we do going forward to help other communities and so on and as much as a lot of things that we've talked about here today uh, one consistent uh, theme that comes from it is um, using the city's resources and tools to help to empower our community and neighborhoods and partners so that we can all be better off at the end of the day because unless we actually have a mechanism or a system in place that allows people to be empowered and help them to be better off and so on a lot of the challenges that we see globally it's happening around the world um, we're going to then be experiencing a lot of those in the sense that people feel disenfranchised, not connected and so on. And I'm not suggesting we have a perfect system at this point. We're working towards it. We have a better system than many other places around the world and that's why we are who we are as a city, Toronto. We care, we, we live up to the axiom, you know, diversity is our strength. We want not to simply use that term and not actually live up to providing the opportunity where people can provide input and all of us collaborating and so on. And I want to thank uh, the landowner that we have been in touch with there for recognizing that he and his company can play a role in the success of this city because he and his company will be better off, so will everybody else and so on. So I hope that we can finalize the arrangement and get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Mayor. Uh, are there uh, any others wishing to speak? Okay, uh, then uh, what we'll do is uh, take a look at the, uh, we've got that right there. Sorry. there. And it is uh, to receive the report for information, so that's the recommendation here, and uh, the Council Councilor, Deputy Mayor Thompson has moved that recommendation. All those in favor, those carried. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, 11.13, improving hydro, improving communications for Toronto Hydro projects, and it was held by Deputy Mayor Bylaw. Uh, one, one more after this. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bylaw, you held 11.13. Yes, I have my questions answered. I, I just, uh, I just want to make a, a, a few comments. It's been. So can I just make sure there, there are no other questions? Then we can move straight to comments. Go ahead, please. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's been uh, hard to get the communications and. Uh, uh, with Toronto Hydra and I think this is just one example I don't know about you but I I'm getting I'm getting suggestions from Toronto Hydra to use section 37 to to do light assessments and to put street lightings that's that's a bit discouraging um, and you did too right yeah so that's the kind of um, relationship that our city is having with one of our agencies and um, I just think that that we everybody needs to work on this but there's there's clearly work that we need to do between the communication with our residents and the communications between the city and uh, Toronto Hydro that needs to improve so okay. just well, wanted to make that comment because uh, it's been very frustrating uh, deputy mayor do you want to make a comment I do I just kind of want to put some a little bit of context to this. This is not a situation where Toronto Hydro is not wanting to do the work. I think there's an arrangement where there was an agreement put in place where Toronto would, Toronto Hydro would do the work, but the city would pay to do that work, and the city hasn't made Toronto Hydro whole. I've had exactly that same problem, and so the, the, to you know, point a finger at Hydro and say you're not communicating very well or it's all your fault. Thank you. Thanks. That's, not, that's not a fair and accurate representation at all, as I understand it. There's a finance piece that the city has to keep up its end, and my understanding there's, is there, there have been discussions about this just very recently, but to, I, I, and I'm on the board of Hydro, but I, and I'm not just doing it because of that. I mean, the behind the scenes, if, if the, Hydro's not given the money that they were promised to do the work that that they were asked to do, or there's more work than they were asked to do, and the city has to make them whole, then the city needs to take so, some ownership of and that, that issue. Thing, so, I, no, no, but the, 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 the arrangement here that it's all Hydra's fault, if that's the characterization, is not fair. Well, I, I took it to that's just all. so we can, uh, that's in, all, in that's the handiness, no, that's fine. In the handiness of having uh, members, I think there's at least one here, 
uh, Council Lansing, I think you, you're still on the board too, right? So I think you can take that back to the board, just saying, look, it's probably better. We should make sure it's transparent for all concerned and whatever. It's, it's not they a matter would like of who's, to do more work. Yeah, it's not a matter of whose fault it is. It's just a matter of getting the work done and making sure we're all satisfied with the financing arrangement. So I think we have two directors sitting here, and they can take that back, and uh, and that's that. They don't need. They'd to. ask us to say. We'll come back to council yeah. and get more money. And you can tell them uh, that I have 109 million reasons to be thankful to them, uh, among other things. But anyway, I think that message, you, both our directors here uh, received that. Okay. I, I, uh, then, uh, pardon me? I just want to make a comment on sure. that, too, and I agree with it. But if that's the case, then why, are, why is Hydro not communicating that to the city? Yeah. No, I. I they haven't communicated local council. They're just telling us, uh, if you have Section 37, we will increase the lighting. Um, we should be told that, in fact, they don't have the funding and they need more funding from the city to do particular projects. I, I don't mean to tell you. So, My only answer to that is I think the public service is aware of this, and I don't believe that Toronto Hydro wants to get involved in a, you know, a public uh, finger-pointed mudslinging arrangement. They're acting as a good partner to the city and talking to staff to try and, to try and resolve this as opposed to, you know, every time a councillor calls, say, you know, call uh, the city manager, it's his fault. That, that's not the, that is not the discourse that they want to have. They want to solve the problem and not you know, get involved in this sort of messy arrangement and, you know, point fingers back. Yeah, well, well, I took from the comments that nobody wants to have that kind of discussion, so why don't we leave it, as I said, that maybe our two directors who happen to be here for this discussion can take it back and just say there's obviously a better communication that's required at the, at the least, and then we'll see if uh, people are still dissatisfied, we can take it up from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So on that, then uh, there was, uh, sorry, again, I don't have it there. Uh, the... There were a number of amendments to the municipal code that went with that, just in terms of uh, uh, printed public notices and whatnot, written notifications. And so, uh, can I ask for someone to move that recommendation, the the, uh, the staff uh, recommendation from Transportation Services, Councillor Annunciata? All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. All right. Uh, last but not least, 11.25 uh, St. Lawrence Centre redevelopment was held by Councillor Crawford. Questions of staff. Mayor. Questions of staff? Yeah, if I could ask the uh, CEO of uh, TO Live to come up. First of all, I want to uh, thank your, your patience and diligence in being here all day listening to executive. Uh, but I do have uh, just a couple of questions for you. So this has been many years in the making. It's a very exciting big project. But can you just talk briefly, and it has been supported uh, unanimously by the TO Live board. Um, so, why this redevelopment? Why this redevelopment? Thank you. St. Lawrence Centre. Uh, and first, of Meritori, Council, thank you for taking the time this afternoon. It's great to be last on the agenda because the room clears and, you know. Uh, we spent an enormous amount of time looking at this. As you probably are aware, this is not the first time that someone has made a proposal to do a redevelopment process in the St. Lawrence Centre. Uh, I believe this is, uh, we are in the fifth round of this discussion that has taken place over maybe a decade or more of different proposals. At this stage, the, the board and the staff at TO Live have spent the last year through a series of in-depth, I'd say, early stage research and development, really looking at the current site, looking at community usage, looking at how we could have a vision for the future, and coming up with a binary decision, which is what is really before council today, which is we have a huge state of good repair backlog, an amount of money which will need to be spent on the building regardless. The question is, do we go that route, or do we actually do what other uh, companies would do, which is look at that, leverage that money, and think about creating something new and better for the city in the downtown core. We are proposing in the TO Live board, unanimous, unanimously adopted, moving to option two, to leverage the money that you have in the state of good repair backlog and really rethink what a cultural hub for the City of Toronto would be. This is the beginning of that process. I can't stress that enough. So with regard, and I appreciate you saying the beginning, what are the next steps? Now, you're, you're here before us, so the Board has brought this to Executive off to Council, of course, to really look at the redevelopment. We do have a, a confidential attachment. Um, but what are the next steps? 
um, on, in this project and trying to see it materialize and realize to full fruition? Okay. We would look at, first of all, who the partners in the community would be. There's a wide group of people that we have begun discussions with, but by no means completed that. There would be a robust community discussion that would go through public consultation, which would begin as well. We would look at governance models once we had partners in place. We would then begin design process uh, and also looking at opportunities on how not only for the mechanics of the art that is to be created in the building, but also how does it relate to the park? How does it relate to the cultural corridor that is being created along Front Street? How does it relate to the larger community and to the uh, transportation hubs in the neighborhood? All of that is, is begun and detailed in the document that you have, but that needs to be fleshed out in a much greater way. Thank you. And just a message, or sorry, a um, question to Mike Williams with regard to the uh, state of good repair. Um, now, we have been hesitant, I think, over the last number of years to spend any real money on this. There's been some money we've had to put into this, but can you just talk about the, the overall state of good repair backlog for the St. Lawrence Centre and why this makes sense to move forward as a redevelopment? Well, I have some information. Clyde would have more detail than I do. Uh, we know, for instance, it's not an AODA uh, qualified. There's no elevator, no easy place to put an elevator. Um, we spend money on the roof because we didn't spend money on the roof, we would risk serious mold problems, which would be very counterproductive to the operations, obviously. Um, it's an old building, so there's still some stuff in there that uh, people don't want to mess with, and so we need to deal with that. Uh, and so, you know, a couple of years ago, Council, during the budget process, saw fit to set aside $30 million, which was based on a building condition audit that was taken at that time. Um, Clyde, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I just want to just correct the number. I believe the number is closer to 40 plus million dollars in the state of good repair backlog, and uh, we need to add in the AODA compliance number to that as well. Okay, that's all my questions. Uh, any other questions of staff? Uh, Councilor Thompson, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, did I hear you correctly, sir? You said it's 40 million dollars worth of work to be done? Yes, plus. Plus, okay. And um, what are you talking about in terms of this redevelopment? What are you planning to put on? So I haven't seen any renderings, drawings, any real plans. Do you have the plans or it's just um, looking for permission to, um, to develop a plan? Uh, through the chair, yes, and that the second is the truth. We are at that moment, we don't, the question is, continue with state of good repair or go forward with the redevelopment. That's the question before you. We, our board has said go forward with redevelopment and at that stage then we would come forward. And then we can start, as I like to think, start dreaming a little bit. Yeah, but I, I'm just trying to understand what does redevelopment look like? Is it just um, a performing arts facility? Is it no. housing? Is it a combination, mixed use? Is it retail? Is it a spa? Is it a, what is it? I'm thinking today, I need a spa. Today, or do you want? Uh, Forever. Through the, so through the chair. Uh, I think that all of those things are yet to be determined. I, I would want to, to caution that the site is a very important site. You're, you're talking about a piece of real estate that is probably one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in the country. And we must dedicate it to culture. I think we need to start to remember that culture needs to be on our list of things that are vital and important to the city. It has been designated for culture. It was built as a millennial, uh, as a uh, 67 project. It's a space for the artist and the community. And to have that kind of valuable research, uh, uh, um, real estate and have it designated for that is super important. Now the question then is, like any other business, if you had an under leveraged, underused piece of real estate, but you knew it could be something greater. You don't want to leave it what it is. You want to ask where can we go in the future? How can we leverage it to be so much more? And that's where we're at. Fair enough. And, and uh, is your group working with CREATO? Is they, are they part of? We, we literally met with them this morning. And yes, we are working with CREATO. We're very excited to have that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No further questions. 
I, I just want to follow up. I didn't have any questions, but I want to follow up on a question that Councillor Thompson um, mentioned, which was um, around where you're going. I understand this is a really important piece of culture. Yes. I'm there with you. So are you still open to what might be possible? So you're not saying that the only thing you're going to have is culture. You're saying that needs to be the predominant. And from there, what else could we have, should we have? Uh, is that where you are, or? Through the chair, I, I respectfully, I want to say it's a site for culture. Now, culture is a very broad term. So culture includes arts, it includes food, it includes how the community comes together. It is, in one study and report, talked about as a bond, a community bond. And so what does that mean when we talk about space in what is obviously one of our most dense areas in the city of Toronto? And we need to look at all of those factors as we go forward and leverage that space. Plus we need, and on a very practical level, you want to think not just about the physical space that's before you, but how does it relate to what Meridian Hall is, which is directly across Scott Street. How does it relate to the park? How does it relate to the general sure. community? There's a physical All of those aspect, things. and then so you would consider, you know, housing, residency programs for artists that could actually work with the culture space and work into all kinds of residency uh, and explore endless opportunities. This, these, this is the journey we would like to begin. Okay, I just wanted to to understand that. Yes. If yeah. that door can, was can open. I just jump in here, just so but the expectations are? You're going to say tempered. yes. Uh, the big, one of the big reasons why free, uh, earlier attempts failed was the massing studies on the site and shading the park so that after five or six stories, it becomes impractical. So one early one was to put a condo tower on top of it, and that failed because of the density and the shading. So, so Councillor McConnell uh, felt that was, and that didn't get anywhere, that one. Second one went further, but it still failed on the massing. So Clyde's going to have a hard time packing everything in. And and all those constraints will have to come into the equation. But I just wanted to understand what the project was open to do or not. Okay. Other uh, questions? Uh, I just have a couple. Uh, did you have one, uh, Councillor? No. no. Okay. Um, first, uh, can I just be clear on? Um, when we talk about this 30 or 40 million dollars, am I right that some of that actually is somewhere in the capital plans of the city, uh, just so that if we don't spend it on the on the uh, renovations or, or upgrade, <coughs> that there is some money to set aside? I think out of that total. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's in the state of good repair. Yeah. So it's it's already with the real estate services and in our budget office, uh, somewhere in above and below the line. Okay, but there's some of it above the line. There the is some already okay. currently above right. the line. Yeah. Now, my second question you won't like much, but uh, it is the following. With a, a building, say, or a car or anything else that is in a state of, uh, you know, uh, in, in need of repairs, there is a timetable. Even when you say, okay, we're not going to go the route of repairing it, we're going to replace it with something or redevelop it or do something, there is a period at which that process of redeveloping, figuring out what you're going to do with it and so on, goes too long, and then you have a problem with the roof or with the AODA. We know that deadline is 2025, for example, so there's an outer deadline. Um, I just wanted to um, just probe a little bit on, on kind of this process that, as you say, is beginning, which is quite proper. I understand what you're saying about that. It fits all the questions you've been asked. Um, uh, I presume that the intention of the process is to make sure before we ever get to the point where the roof collapses, because we've made a perfectly valid decision not to stick with the status quo and not repair it, but that we hadn't moved on fast enough with the whatever it's going to replace it or whatever it's going to be take its place, that we will be mindful of that. Yes. So one of the reasons we're asking this question now is so that we don't go down the road of spending money that will be misspent and tore down. But also we need to take, uh, you know, the infrastructure of the building is antiquated and very, very much in disrepair. Um, we are keeping it together and maintaining it at its current level. But we, it's not going to, uh, it won't last forever. And the, the AODA compliance rule is really the hard and fast driver here. If, if you want to become compliant to AODA compliance by 2025, just do a work back schedule. The, there is no way currently for an artist of disability to get on that stage. 
Okay? That's, so that to me, as somebody who works in this business, is unacceptable. So you, if to make that work, you'd have to blow off the back of the building. So, yeah. And I think you, you, you follow my point, which was I agree with all of that 100%. Yeah. But that we also, time is not on our side. It is not. Moving forward with the process you talked about, which we often get very bogged down in. Uh, you know, for reasons of people trying to jam too much in, for example, or some such thing. I'm just making the point uh, that I trust you would agree with that uh, if we're going to take the approach of saying we're not going to spend a lot more money than we, any more money than we absolutely have to to keep the building standing because we've decided to redevelop it, we've got to get on with it with a degree of dispatch, and including the point about AODA. Absolutely needs to be a speedy, thoughtful approach. Right. Okay. That was all for me. Now, uh, are there anybody else with questions? Hearing none. I'll then ask for speakers, and I know I think you have a motion as well, Councillor Crawford. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a motion that I have to move. It's a technical motion that City Council direct the confidential attachment, one, to the report of the President and the Chief Executive Officer to you live remain confidential in its entirety as it pertains to a plan to be applied to the any, any negotiations carried on or carried on or behalf or be on behalf of the Board of Directors of TO Live. That's just in essence to keep everything confidential at this point. Um, I've had the opportunity, I'm, I'm on, the, on the board, I'm on the, actually the vice chair of the board, um, and I've had um, an opportunity many, many years ago to really look at what we should be doing with these theatres. Um, if executive recall, about two years ago we amalgamated all three civic theatres into one uh, entity called TO Live. We've hired a CEO and they've been doing incredible work over the last couple of years to really look at the seven stages and how do they manage uh, these performing arts uh, stages all across the city. Um, we are now at a point um, with TO Live to really start looking at a huge opportunity which is the redevelopment of the St. Lawrence Centre. It has been in many years in the making has, uh, as has been mentioned. We've looked at a number of iterations of what we can do and they have all kind of fallen to the wayside. Timing was a, a, an issue at one point. But understanding there's a huge opportunity here. Uh, it's a very, very valuable piece of cultural real estate in the city, sitting beside uh, Meridian Hall. Um, and it, has, it is underutilized. Uh, I forgot to ask the questions of the utilization of this particular space. It's an old building that we really don't utilize, and not that we don't want to, and not because there's not a market there. It's just the way it is designed. It doesn't meet the needs of the present-day um, performing arts industry. So we're, we're looking at an opportunity to transform this. It'll benefit not only the city, it'll benefit the St. Lawrence community, um, but it is the beginning of a process. Um, I think what the board is looking for now is a go-ahead from council and us to say, you know what, go off and start putting together the plan of what this will look like. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have to work with a lot of different city agencies, a lot of the tenants, um, a lot of the divisions in the city, and come back with a plan uh, that really puts a lot of meat onto the bones of what they're looking at doing. Um, I'm encouraged by seeing, uh, when you're looking at the board, you're looking at the people on there and with our CEO, and everybody that is coming to the table, there's a huge opportunity, and I think this is the timing. As I said, I've been involved in about four different um, opportunities over the last nine years. I think this is the timing, or this is the right time to be looking at the redevelopment of the St. Lawrence Centre. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Crawford. Any other comments on uh, uh, speak, speakers on this uh, item 11.25? All right. We have then. Yeah, we're gonna, we have an amendment. That they just moved a motion. Just moved to amend uh, from Councillor Crawford to do with confidentiality. And I'll. I'm sorry. Did you want to speak, Councillor? Oh, okay. Uh, 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 on the amendment, then. Uh, we'll, we'll have the on the amendment. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. And the item as amended. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. Okay, I think that completes our business for the day. With thanks to everybody, and uh, we will see you at council, if not before. Thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned.